I need to be monitoring. So just a few uh, instructions on uh, Bradford's screen. Just wanted to let people know as they come in that uh, we will be recording this to add as a resource on the uh, PMSP website. Um, we're super excited to have you with us today. Um, we'll get started here when, when uh, more participants join. Welcome. We're going to try to have a hard start in about two minutes, but if you are able to go to the Patterns Approach teacher site, click on the workshop agenda, then get to the idea capture tool, which is in that list of important links, and then scroll down to find a click here to add your name. Go ahead and add it. So a tool we use with students and something that we'll use in the webinar as well. If you're done with that, if you want to just take a peek at uh, who else is in the room, so to speak, in the Zoom, I guess. And a re just a reminder, I said it a couple times, but if you just came in, we are recording this webinar. And thank you for. Uh, we knew there were some last minute changes that Zoom account was double booked. So we had to make that change. Again, for those of you who are just joining us, um, if you could go to the Patterns Approach teacher site, click on work, workshop agenda, which is a tab at the top. And then at the top, there's a, a list of important links. One of them is the idea capture tool. That's the place where we will have uh, questions, um, get some reflections in there, uh, kind of meet other participants who are here. So if you would scroll down, you can double click and uh, click, at, uh, click here to type. And that will uh, um, record your, your thoughts for today. We'll just give people another minute or two here. Um, that link on the workshop agenda will have other links that you'll use today um, that will be the links to uh, the distance learning calendar, but also um, uh, a document that we'll be looking at uh, together later in the session. It also has the agenda that we will be going, so you could uh, look over that as well. for 
quick access to that site. I'm going to also post it in the, um, the Zoom chat. That's a quick, quick link to the agenda. It's just about 20 seconds and we'll get started. Okay, we kind of have a soft start here. So if you want to just look over the idea capture tool, quick introductions and uh, goal setting for the webinar. So I am Bradford Hill, science and engineering teacher at Mountainside High School in Beaverton, Oregon. I'm Matt McCollum. Uh, I also teach at Mountainside, uh, teach uh, physics and IB physics. Let's do, um, Really, we got such little time. So it's 55 minutes left. And uh, so we wanna give you an overview of the unit one distance learning student calendar. And then um, just it's always important to kind of get in there and experience a little bit at the student level. So the agenda is gonna start with an overview and it really is like a presentation. So this is a webinar, not a workshop. So we are going to be presenting the calendar and then uh, in the last about 15, 20 minutes, get you diving in a little bit more, analyzing some example work. Yeah, uh, when you have questions, uh, there's two ways that you could, you could interrupt us and ask. Um, first is the parking lot. We won't necessarily be looking at that live, but you could go to the parking lot, which is in the idea capture tool. Um, and uh, that's a good place to put questions that can be held um, till the end. We will do a Q&A at the end and answer some of those um, verbally. Any questions that we don't get to verbally we can do, um, we'll, we'll type out. Um, and then if you have other questions, uh, maybe for participants, uh, you can ask, it, uh, ask those in the Zoom chat uh, down at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so just a quick look at our calendar. We're gonna start with uh, a overview of unit one and then the student experience reflect and address questions. So just to be clear to give you, kind of bring up that view, unit one, of course you're gonna to get to it on the Patterns Approach teacher site, click on unit one, it'll bring you to this web page. And distance learning is a little different it has its own learning calendar. You will need to make a copy and there's a link right here. I'm showing it on my page. And I would actually say, please don't do that right now. I think I might lose you with the pace that we're gonna do in a webinar. So there's a template, you make a copy and there's also a tutorial, but I'm just gonna show a um, little more. So again, you, you know, one familiar, we really did want the aims were to keep student talk and inquiry at the center, even with distance learning. So let's say the inquiry cube, which Matt's gonna talk about here in just a minute. Um, I'll just want, the thing I wanna point out is everything in purple, you'll eventually delete. When you make a copy of this, you'll click on this link, you'll make a, your own copy of those Google slides and then paste it in right here. There's a video tutorial that walks you through exactly how to do this, but it is um, that straightforward. You're just gonna make a copy in each class period you're gonna to need to do this for. So if you teach three classes, you will make three calendars. So, you know, period one, period two, period three. And they each need their own links. Otherwise, all the students from all the classes will get into the same documents, which we, you probably wanna avoid. Maybe there's some case where, you know, it doesn't matter, but you probably wanna avoid that. Okay, with that, we are going to do an overview of unit one. So I'm just gonna go back to the agenda to show everything on just one little inch of screen. Just to be clear, the flow, the activity flow is, maybe it's the student, I'm gonna to go to the distance learning calendar one time. Inquiry cube, pendulum experiment, ball on floor experiment, 
our claim evidence reasoning with the cat, coin experiment, paragraph experiment, and then um, something that we've done before but now fully releasing is the pattern student choice project. Okay, so we're gonna go and hit a highlight of each one of these and then take a deeper dive into one of the experiments. So Matt, if you wanna uh, talk about the inquiry cube, I'll pull up the slides. So the inquiry cube, it has a set of slides and here we're only gonna look at slide six and Matt, I'll let you take it away. Uh, so just for the overview period, just to reiterate what Bradford said, we're going to take a deep dive into like one aspect of each of the activities. Um, when we get into the four different labs that we do, we're going to focus more on the fourth lab and you'll see the overall kind of arc of a, a full picture with the paragraph lab. Um, but for our overview, we're just going to do a deep dive into one or two of the slides that kind of function there. Um, in this case, uh, this is the inquiry cube activity and we're just going to focus on this slide. Students will be in groups. Um, uh, we're going to be having students in groups of two uh, at the start and then they'll join bigger groups, groups of four. And each uh, group, each mini group will get um, uh, basically part of the cube. So Bradford, if you could click on that, uh, that video there. It's just a video of uh, three of the sides of the cube. And so you can see this is uh, group one, green. And uh, it's a video of the top of the cube and of two of the other sides. And they will be taking data on the inquiry cube there uh, on, on that slide. So this is a, a group slide. So the, the group will be editing this and uh, you'll be able to see live what students are doing. Um, they can color slides by dragging those those cubes at the bottom um, and so they just drag over and they can co color over the slides they can take the data of the names and the uh, the um, numbers that are there uh, students will come back together um, uh, as a class and then give further instructions that the groups will be kind of merged to uh, to create larger groups uh, then they can compare their data and compare two sides of the or all of the sides of the inquiry cube um, rather than just having that that one aspect so we're still focusing on uh, student talk we're still focusing on the student need for generating knowledge together uh, finding patterns and going from there um, uh, one thing to note is that uh, while in the regular school year we um, uh, tend to want to jump right into inquiry cube. This is something that we'll probably have to be doing a, uh, some pre-learning and community building for the unique situation for distance learning. Um, so with that, I think Bradford, why don't you um, talk about the uh, pendulum experiment? Okay, so <clears throat> sorry about that. I Hopefully this is helpful. I'm going to move back to the calendar. So again, our next big task our loopity loop is that pendulum experiment this is our first experiment so really in the model guide step aside strongly modeling and so how are we going to do that here with every experiment they do a wild guess it's fun this one could be done live if you have that synchronous time or just make a video of yourself with a simple pendulum right at home if uh, you're not able to get into the school but in any case the kind of the innovative feature that we want to show you here is that it has a class data collection. So all the students would jump in on this uh, Google spreadsheet and they can enter it. And it's pretty simple. If you have a class list, you can um, enter their names and not manually. Um, if you do know how to transpose a, a set of class names, you can then just paste it in. So you can see an example there and then students see their own name when they're showing up. So they would, of course, then enter their data as you go through. It is already going to find the range of their data. And so again, just as we always say, the first data point takes like five, maybe 10 minutes, but then data points after that go really quick. So my suggestion is you take that 50 degree angle until the range of the data, the biggest time minus the smallest time or the flip of that. Uh, yeah, I said it right. 
uh, that spread of data should be pretty close, but with 30 people testing, it's not going to be within like three tenths of a second. So just be ready for that. And then it averages for them. They would of course put that back into Desmos. We will take the deeper dive into teacher Desmos with lab four. So again, just showing the highlight is here's a chance to have all the students have a name on the screen and taking data together. And of course, if you want it to be anonymous, you just wouldn't put their names in. With that, I'm gonna hand it back. We're gonna go back to the calendar go down to ball on floor experiment and I'll hand it over to Matt to show a highlight there. All right, so with the, uh, all of our uh, experiments for the patterns units, there is uh, this teacher Desmos and this is the side of teacher Desmos. This is a student preview. Again, uh, Bradford's going to show a little bit more in depth later into this, uh, Teacher Desmos side. But essentially what Teacher Desmos is, is a way to make activities uh, that your students can engage with. They can um, uh, uh, get feedback and uh, you can see where they are, control what slide they're on and what slides they're able to view. So in this case, this is the proportional experiment. And Bradford, if you could click on uh, the video there. They start with a wild guess of a bowling ball just rolling down a ramp. Um, we're looking at the bowling ball rolling on the floor and uh, we have uh, some uh, distance markings there as well as the time. And students can guess, uh, do their simple wild guess of how far they will, will, will do. They can share with the class and um, anonymously see what other students uh, did. Then Bradford, could you go to the next slide as well? Within Teacher Desmos, um, there is you know, some functionality. So in this case, on that dotted line there, uh, on that graph, it shows their prediction. Uh, and students can also uh, use this to make their hypothesis. So uh, they can you know, uh, uh, do their hypothesis like we do on a, on a typical lab. Um, and you can show and see those their graphs, and then they can also do that in words. So they can describe their hypothesis in words, all while on the teacher side, you can see where students are at, control um, what screens they're looking at, um, and you can even um, snapshot and uh, share to the class what students would be doing. Um, we'll, we'll show you a, a more deeper dives into this in our other activities. So. Um, this is what our uh, uh, horizontal, or uh, sorry, proportional fit looks like. Um, and then Bradford's going to show you uh, claim evidence reasoning. Um, yeah. Yep. So uh, I guess we've assumed some familiarity with the unit one patterns and in inquiry. So we, of course, always try to start with a very uh, unintimidating start to challenging skills. So we want students writing claim evidence reasoning. And so the most uh, friendly one is just that, is the cat going up or down the stairs? You can see that image there. I'm also going to jump into a teacher Desmos that was made for it. Um, I'll also add that teacher Desmos can be kind of thought of as slides that has a little more teacher control. So in any case, you know, it's just that simple image. Is that cat going up or down? And then we'll show the next slide. And they're going to write their sentence. And this is gonna be powerful because you as a teacher can see what everyone's writing and you can then even decide to share what everyone's writing with other students. And again, just to show that color coding, it is valuable. So many students, when they are mixing claims, evidence, and reasoning all together, that color coding really helps. There's a built-in feature here that's going to grab what they write for claim evidence reasoning and put it together on the last slide. And that's a chance to go back. The only way to write better is to write better. Okay, so we wanna have see what they're writing, give them feedback, and then have them write again. But as you write, it's cool that it shows up here. You can see it here but it's also gonna grab it and put it all together for them. And then that's the chance to have them revise their writing. The only way to write better is to write better. There are, of course, sentence stems down here in the teacher calendar. 
our big, huge one that has all the resources. Remember, there's three to five levels of extra support that you can have to give students at this point. Those are in the teacher calendar, as they always are. That was just our little dip into claim evidence reasoning in a distance learning format. So I'm gonna go back to the calendar. And uh, just as a reminder, um, I know that we're diving into this uh, quickly. Use the parking lot to ask any questions that you have, or you could also put them uh, questions to participants in the chat. Um, with that, the next kind of loop that we have is our quadratic experiment. And um, we're trying to stick true to our values of students taking data and uh, then analyzing that data. So in this case, uh, students will be taking data within Desmos. Um, so again, this is this is slide five. There are slides that show up before this in the quadratic experiment, but uh, they are taking their data on how many uh, pennies fit into a circle. Uh, we opted to do pennies into a circle uh, rather than marbles into a circle just because of uh, resources and so we can do this within Desmos uh, through this, this widget. And students uh, will take that data. So Bradford, if you wouldn't mind putting um, that data in. So uh, due to the widget, it's measured in inches, it converts it to um, uh, uh, centimeters. And then you have students uh, will change data, uh, add more uh, pennies to the mix. And um, all the while students are, uh, again, engaging in this, taking their own data, um, going from there. Then uh, on the next slide, students will uh, graph. So this shouldn't be a surprise if you're familiar to uh, the patterns approach. We have a graph. Um, it has automatically taken the data from the previous slide and students will uh, drag the slider back and forth uh, to find the fit uh, for their data. I guess it's worth saying here too that we have made the realization and I don't know where people are at and if we're all gonna settle at the same point, but you know, it's the model guide step aside. There's much less in each lab now. So, you know, that fact that it automatically plots their data for them. We are gonna take longer to turn over a full lab report to students in the distance learning model. Yeah, I guess the other thing that is among this is um, uh, we, we recognize just with our experience in the, in the spring um, that uh, we can't do all of the good stuff that we normally do in class. We're trying to keep, when we've designed this, uh, you know, one of our design principles was to focus on keeping the, the things that we value the most. So uh, taking data, having discussions, um, and generating uh, knowledge together. So with that, um, Bradford's going to go um, over the fourth experiment uh, a little bit here. We'll go a little bit more in depth uh, later in the webinar as well. Yep, great. So to keep that high level uh, aspect, so lab four paragraph experiment, again, just not meant to be the coolest physics. We don't want to cognitive load. And I think in the distance learning model, cognitive load is going to be even more important we've already seen it in the spring we saw it in summer workshops when you're moving between tabs and uh, a calendar and an activity that takes up cognitive load so we want to max out that cognitive load but we don't want to overdo it and so packing too much in can have everything fall apart on us so with that said paragraph experiment the highlight for anyone uh, not familiar with it in the distance learning model, we're gonna have the data be taken online. So here's a page, here's all those paragraphs that we're used to. You can just grab this ruler, drag it. So this first paragraph is 10.5 centimeters wide. And you of course can drag it. And then you can, there's some instructions up here. You have to hold down control and drag the mouse to rotate it vertically. But just want to give you a peek. We're going to come back to this experiment and show a little bit more of what you can do with Teacher Desmos. But the data collection, just so you know, uh, you're not going to be having to shuffle paper or, of course, 
over to distance learning, they can still be taking data, entering it into the data table. We will circle back to this. So just as a highlight on paragraph four, uh, the data collection is done that way. And then a project that we have added, we have done it before, but now we're adding it to the official calendar brings in some student choice. And so I'm gonna let Matt talk about it and then maybe add a couple things at the end of that. Yeah, so um, we decided uh, just to get students uh, more uh, uh, kind of student choice uh, in the patterns project. So Bradford, if you could click on uh, the uh, tab there. Uh, this is kind of in a, a student um, uh, Google Slides, and uh, they're going to start by just brainstorming ideas of things that they're uh, interested in. They're going to look at uh, some data and uh, kind of make some light, light conclusions. So um, uh, this brainstorming slide is essentially uh, students are coming up with as many ideas as they can. So many times we get to, in my case, IB physics and uh, students aren't um, really used to asking their own questions. So we want to uh, you know, facilitate that right in unit one. Um, so we kind of at, have some prompts there. What are some uh, personal, uh, some things in your personal life that you might be interested in investigating? In the middle, what are some things in your community that you might be investigating? And then uh, what are things in the, the world that you might be interested in investigating? Um, and we, in the third column there, we include a, a link to some, uh, some uh, graphs that are available by New York Times that kind of lead students to uh, question making. Um, so they are, they're playing around with these ideas. Uh, then on the next slide, um, let me jump in and just one yeah. add one thing here. So the two the two big meta messages of this project are we want students taking connecting what they're learning in class to their lives. And this is just taking that on explicitly. So it's you know it's interesting to think that if you learn Newton's laws you'll somehow bring that to critical thinking on media social media posts that you see that's that's a big transfer we see that when we change the axes from x and y to distance and time students have a hard time transferring their knowledge from math class to physics class so we know transfer is hard so we want to be explicit what are the things you're interested in if you are interested in social justice environmental justice this is a chance to bring that into the class very early on of course we have that in other units but we want that early and we want it explicitly how do you take evidence-based reasoning to something you care about? All right, with that, I'll jump back and show. So with that evidence-based reasoning, um, this, is, uh, this prompt here is just to get students to start to interact with data. So um, there's lots of avenues that they could go with this. Maybe they took data on um, themselves from data from their phone or uh, data for, uh, from how long they were sleeping. Uh, they can put that data in their proposed uh, you know, independent and dependent variables and get a, some sort of graph or visualiz visualization of that data. <clears throat> Same goes if they uh, decide to look at something um, in the world. Uh, they can get that data, data mine it from somewhere else. Um, uh, a great resource is, were those links on slide two, and they can um, get that graph, visualize it somehow. And then on the last slide, uh, just the thoughts, wonderings, conclusions, um, students are, <coughs> are just in, engaging in the inquiry, um, uh, kind of looking at our meta message that inquiry allows us to better predict the future, make decisions, um, how does, how do does their individual research affect uh, or relate to to making those patterns um, and predictions? Also, looking at um, there's like questions or wonderings. There's more questions that students have. What other uh, conclusions could they make? Uh, what are some next steps that they could do uh, from there? So, uh, really open, really uh, broad for students, but also uh, really engaging in their their student in uh, interest. So just to put the scope out there, uh, we got the question during the workshop, is this for honor students? No, this is for every student. Now that opens 
that openness can make that difficult. Now we, we want it open so that they can pick whatever they want. Now you might need to scale that. And I'll say that you could turn this into a 30 minute activity. If you did go back to slide two and click on here, that's uh, those are well supported. You could, this could be a 30 minute activity, but that reduces a lot of the student choice and the narrows what they're gonna focus on. So you do have that latitude though. If someone was gone and they're coming back, maybe you wanna send them to one of those uh, already collected questions that already has some wraparound context to it. But if you have a student that is passionate about something and wants to see that connection and bring the tools that they are learning in physics class to their lives, this is a structured opportunity for that. All right, with that, uh, just a quick comment on assessment. So the assessments are right here in the calendar. Of course, they're in the restricted folder because we wouldn't give access to students to those. And those are by um, agreement in Google Doc format and really different uh, districts are handling that different ways. So. Yeah, different districts are handling assessment in different ways. Um, we, in connection with uh, you know other groups, decided to just leave them in our in the Google Doc format and um, have teachers decide whether they do Google Classroom or Canvas for those assessments. Maybe go formative. There's lots of different ways that those assessments could be handled. Um, all of them are still very ap applicable to what we've been doing, and uh, uh, so we've linked those there. Um, also, I guess I'll mention homework. Um, we also linked homework, and so you can see just even at the top of Bradford's um, screen there, it says homework like Minilab uh, Scenario D. That's a, a Google Doc. Um, there are some other ones that are uh, uh, Desmos Teachers uh, uh, things like that one that Bradford has highlighted there, predicting Lego prices is a, a teacher Desmos. Uh, uh, piece. So there's uh, ample opportunity for students to practice, practice outside of um, whatever synchronous or asynchronous time you have with them. Okay, so zooming out, that's the overview of the unit. And we are pretty much right on time. So that's good. That means that we're gonna have some time for questions at the end. And I do encourage you to put them in the parking lot, because I think even while you are working on the data discussion slides, we can be answering multiple questions at a time uh, while you're there. So we're about to take the dive into the student experience, a peek at the student experience, a peek at Teacher Desmos. Again, webinar, so this is a lot of information condensed to a short time, more in the presentation format. With that said, let's go and look at Teacher Desmos. So here is a behind the scenes look at Teacher Desmos, and I gotta move the Zoom bar out of the way. So you can have all your students over here. They are anonymous names because I clicked on the anonymous button. You would get here again from the teacher distance learning calendar. When you click on that link for teachers, you will be taken to the Teacher Desmos. Without going too far in, a really nice thing about Teacher Desmos is you can determine what slide students are on. So by clicking on pacing, by clicking on pacing, I can say, I want everyone on the wild guess. So I can restrict to page three. So everyone's screen is gonna to go to page three. And then as you move forward, after you get some wild guesses, you can see as the teacher, you can see everyone's wild guess. We made it so students can only, the default in Desmos is to show just three random students. But then when it's time to move on to slide four and you wanna make sure everyone's with you, you can hit that right arrow button and you can see and move everyone to the hypothesis phase. Then eventually they're going to take their own data. We already gave a peek at that online and you can see everyone's graph and there's also an overlay feature. So you can show the whole class's data at a single time and so you can see what's going on here. And so we can get what the class averages are. And that's gonna be powerful for the data discussion because we also gotta manage time in addition to everything else without making students keep co copying and pasting over all of these. So you can get the class averages here. 
And then we want to move them after they've collected their data, got their graph and they've written in their mathematical model that we want them to engage in a data discussion. And so that's what we're going to have you look at. So I'm about to show you something. Data discussions are in Google slides and there's, there's trade-offs. Um, you know, we've made the suggestion that it is worthwhile to have all students in the same Google slides. That's powerful because you just have to manage one. That's good for the teacher because you can go through and see students working. That has the downside that a student could accidentally go to another group and, you know, like write something or delete something. So there's going to be some routine building and norm setting around this. But in any case, the first slide, which is what the link on the calendar would take them to, is always going to be their group, and then they can click on what group they are in. One suggestion, depending on how you make your breakout groups, but if they're in breakout group two, they should go to group two. If they're in breakout room five or link five, however you do it, they would be in group five. All right, with that said, I'm going to guide you through it and then just the first slide, and then we're going to have you get in breakout rooms and discuss this as teachers. But again, that first slide, just that, what is it? You can put your names here. And then, so you get the flow. This is the blank template that students start with. They would copy and paste their graph right here and compare it to the class averages and write. The next slide, which you'll see, says filled out example. This is, has some example responses. And then the next slide would be, again, goes back to the blank, orienting to the data, our flow of data discussions, and so on. So at this point, there's, I think we'll just, we wanna encourage as much um, talking. And of course, that's also what we did in the class, is that if one person's talking, or sorry, if we're all together, you're really only having one person talk, so if we want more people talking, we've got to get them into smaller groups. And there's just so much evidence that when people are in a group that gets over like four or five, they're not talking as much. So we want to overcome that. All right, with that, it looks... So uh, Bradford, you're going to need to make the breakout room. So let me just give a couple of instructions while Bradford's making those, since you're the host. Yeah. Um, when you get into... Right. Uh, there, we would encourage you to um, go through the slides linearly. Um, and uh, you'll be in a group of maybe just two or three people. So you can discuss um, what, what you see, really just discuss what you see. How, how do you think your students would engage uh, in this? We know that you haven't done um, the experiment today, so maybe it's not fresh for you, but um, talk about what you see on the slides. Um, how those are engaged with, how your students might engage with those slides, how might you uh, do this with your students. Again, that little um, purple uh, bar at the top shows when it's a student example versus when it's just the base, the base slides. If you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. All right, so, uh, so real, go ahead. Hold on, did you tell them how to get here? Oh. On the agenda. If you go back to the agenda, you'll see, and I got too many things on my screen in the way. On the agenda, it says Google slide-based data discussion right there. So you'll need to click on that to get in. Also, I, just to be clear. Just send it out in the chat if that's a quicker way for you to get there. If this is, we wanted to show this because it's something you might use in class as well. On the idea capture tool, Lots of times once you're in a breakout room, it's very hard for the teacher to move around quickly, or you have to be in the room to add, go back and forth with a student. So in the idea capture tool, we are suggesting that you put the task right here. So I have too many things from Zoom on my screen to do it. If you have a question in your breakout room, you can type it under urgent questions. So I'm gonna leave that screen up. You can also, of course, within Zoom, flag the facilitator. But sometimes if you have six or seven groups and you got to go in and it takes you a minute or two and the whole discussion is only 10 minutes, you need another channel to have students and participants be able to ask you questions. So in that case, 
you are reviewing the slides and I'm gonna keep it short because we wanna maximize your time in the groups. So with that said, I'm about to uh, invite you to join your room. So I'm gonna open all rooms. There we go. So I believe you got the assignments. Welcome, welcome back. Oh yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, welcome back. We just um, hope that time uh, is valuable. Um, with the last about 13 minutes, uh, what we hope that you do is um, have a little bit of time to reflect. We'll get maybe two or three minutes. Um, and um, then we will uh, answer questions. Uh, we already, we took some time while you were in breakout rooms to answer on the parking lot. So, uh, but I'm sure more questions come up. So uh, with that, Bradford has highlighted uh, questions five and six in the uh, idea capture tool. Um, again, if you need to go to the idea capture tool, I just, um, if you don't have a link to it, I just posted it in the chat. And uh, we're just asking you to reflect on what are the strengths of data discussions in Google Slides and what's one, uh, a one sentence, sentence summary or takeaway from today. Um, we'll give you maybe two minutes here to just um, do that reflection and that response. Um, and when you are done with that reflection response, if you have more questions, feel free to look back at the parking lot. We answered questions there. Um, and you could also um, put, post those in the chat. So I'll give you about two minutes here um, to reflect on questions five and six. Linda, if you click on that link, it'll pop you down to where your question prompts are. It's been about one minute, so we'll give you one more minute here. as we start to transition to the Q and A portion, we do want to encourage you to write it still in the parking lot, one that's going to then stay and it allows us to have multiple people going at one time. Sometimes a question is relevant to just one person or a small group. This is again, something we advocate for in class as well. And then you as the teacher or us as the facilitators can go and be responding to one or two people while someone else is still asking a new question. Uh, Again, it's a small group though. I think we can also handle uh, audio questions. So at this point, if you are ready, if you want to, I hope I see a couple new questions there. If you wanna write in the parking lot just at the top here, I will just respond 
verbally to one question, although I think it's already been answered up here, is yes, we have switched away from the old lab templates while we're in distance learning mode to be handled with all it within Teacher Desmos. The longer version of that is yes, we do, they, we do need multiple tabs. There's no getting away from multiple tabs. You could put everything into a learning management system. However, then it, the screen is smaller than that. Remember that all the learning management systems have their wraparound. Students have pretty small screens to begin with. So I think we do wanna teach them how to have, I think it's just three tabs every class. Class, clown, class, website. Some days it's Desmo, some days it's Google Slides, some days it's an extra one. Sometimes we do need another site for them to take data on. That's not, it's not always gonna be within Desmos. So that is a routine that we gotta establish early in the year and, and count on. Um, and I don't think it ever gets you know, above maybe four tabs, but most of the time it's two, right? So just two tabs. Okay, with that, uh, I might stop talking and then try to answer some of the parking lot questions and let someone jump in with a question or Matt might have a comment. Yeah, uh, I, there was just one comment at the top. Where do you suggest going to get a crash course on Teacher Desmos? Um, I, I, I linked a couple of videos, um, webinars that I attended, um, and Desmos videos. One thing that I would su suggest doing is on your com uh, computer, uh, starting a Teacher Desmos activity, and then on your phone or somebody else's computer, uh, enter in as a student and that kind of allows you to see um, both sides of it. That was one kind of uh, tip that I that I learned while I was trying to play around with Teacher Desmos before going live with the students. Are there any um, questions that people either want to ask on the parking lot or just in audio? What what other questions do do people have? I think you guys answered all of my questions on the parking lot, but I'm super thankful <laughs> for you guys doing this. I felt so nervous um, having taught this for lots and lots of years, but I feel like a first year teacher with all this digital stuff and you guys did an amazing job. I was like jumping up and down in my seat about some of this stuff, the, <laughs> the penny thing, super cool. Yeah. I love it, thank you. Yes. Awesome. One thing that we found last week um, or two weeks ago when, when doing a workshop for the same material is that um, uh, it's uh, just important to be organized as the facilitator, making sure that you have uh, links. And uh, um, one suggestion that we heard was having um, a, a separate device like your phone or something also in the Zoom call to make sure that uh, when you're sharing your screen, you can check your phone or iPad or a separate device if you have one um, that you're sharing that. Um, just those different technical difficulties that pop up. And Good and also it's worth noting that if, if you find um, corrections or make improvements, please share those back. We don't want, you know, people also don't like things to change, but if there's a correction that needs to be made, we definitely want to get that fixed. So uh, at this point, things are locked in so teachers can make copies uh, so you can set up your own classrooms. I do believe that there'll be a webinar on unit two. We don't have a date yet. And that's sort of a just in time. So that's probably a few weeks away. But of course, you can also just go on the website and preview it if you want, if that helps you. But that will be coming. A question I have that I would love feedback on too is, you know, webinar is kind of the right amount of time for some people, an hour. That is what people have. 
uh, we had the summer workshops, but there is a question is, is there like, do people want to spend three hours? So it's not such an overview and just presentation, a little more dive into teacher Desmos, that tool use, a deeper discussion of supports that we can have when you're on those data discussions. Again, we want them saying stuff like the same input and then actually go to the discussion and you might have seen that. I'm going to hop over there if this is interesting. During the workshop, people appreciated it. Have them actually insert the line. You know, go up here, grab line, and if they input 10 for both paragraphs, have them draw the line from zero to 10 and actually do that. You know, we know students are going to be reluctant, and a student who sees that and is doing that all mentally is going to be talking to a student that hasn't done that mentally and they're not going to be on the same page and they're going to that day discussion won't be as fruitful so those sort of um, teacher facilitation moves there wasn't a lot of time in the webinar for that but if there is interest do we want to have like a longer three hour and that's a question if people have time for it and what time of day would actually make that work Okay, so if uh, we do hope to get feedback, so just on those couple things that I've said, but also just the webinar as a whole, like how do we, we are going to do this again uh, Thursday, seven to eight, so that evening time that may work better for some people. If you can think of improvements that we should do, uh, that would be helpful to all of those participants as well. So we appreciate the feedback. And that might be just in the idea capture tool. If you're willing to just, if after the last thing you wrote, the one sentence takeaway, if you just hit return, it should auto add a new number and give us that feedback. We'd appreciate it. With that, uh, we'll do one last round of other questions, but we will kind of try to sign off together. Something that feels a little awkward, but uh, in the spring, I think it people appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Yep. See a hand raise. I will have to say Bradford and Matt, thank you very much. And of course, I really appreciate that I'm able to be in this like kind of follow up and it's a great summary because not only was I in the, um, the long week long workshop, which was very intense, this actually kind of ties it together. And now that I've added the extra piece, which is Canvas, we were introduced to that. And then of course, Go Formative, having this refresher really makes a difference in terms of like, how can I put it all together? It was really kind of a, you know, all over in my, the way that I was trying to think how I, I could do this. And of course, it really would be helpful if you sent out that to the others who were in that workshop. I'm sure everyone is probably thinking, um, that it was so long ago and then to pull it all together, I think it would be helpful. So I could say that for me, it's really been very beneficial. Awesome, good to hear. And that's a great recommendation. And I, I think, yeah, that we should be doing that. And I think we will. Okay, we're at that 10 o'clock. Uh, Matt and I probably are gonna hang out for a few more minutes, but we'll make the official end. So if you're willing to unmute yourself, I'll just do a three, two, one countdown and we just all say bye at the same time. Just a little bit of kind of closure in this Zoom world. So if you're ready, uh, and then we'll hang out though. So three, two, one, we'll stop the recording. If you've got any questions that you didn't want to ask earlier, just have a chance to ask it and we'll sign off. So three, two, one, bye. Bye. Bye.